Hello there. Let's look at VXLANs. Now, a bit of a weird introduction here. I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to do this in this series, but I decided upon doing it here, right after the VLANs, because it is a related technology. It is meant to be the successor to VLANs, at least in the data center. They're quite involved and, in my opinion, a bit advanced for Network Plus. To give you an idea, if you pursue networking further and do something like CCNA, they don't touch it there. And most other networking vendors for their associate level certifications also don't touch it. Earliest you'll start seeing VXLANs again will be at a professional level certification like CCNP. So it's a bit weird in my opinion because CompTIA never touched this in previous versions of Network Plus, but now it's part of the syllabus. So let's treat this as a introduction so that when you see this later on in your career, it's not all going to be brand new all at once. And if you want, maybe come back to this video a little bit later on when you finish the series so that maybe you'll walk away with a bit of better understanding. Because once you've had a look at things like VLANs and a bit of data center and WAN stuff, VXLANs do make a bit more sense. But for now, let's get into it. So first up, VXLANs in general or Virtual Extensible Local Area Networks. We love our acronyms, I keep telling you this. And what it does is it allows us to run a virtualized layer two network over a layer three infrastructure. Which you're thinking, hang on, is this gonna allow us to run VLANs over rooted infrastructure? Yes, it does. And this actually extends the capability and volume of our virtual LANs as well. So besides now allowing separate VLAN infrastructures and different LAN segments to be able to actually work as one, we are gonna have more of them too. So now with those two things combined, it basically allows us to have our layer two broadcast domain crossing layer three infrastructure without causing a problem obviously for unrelated network segments. And one of the big things that also has a major selling point for VXLANs is it is a lot more standardized. It is documented by the IETF RFC document 7348. And at least as far as I'm aware, there are no vendor proprietary implementations of VXLANs. It is all open standard. Now, I know in the previous VLAN video, we spoke about 802.1Q, which is the open standard implementation of VLANs, and every respectable vendor supports it. But also, those vendors usually support their own proprietary implementation as well. And more often than I like to admit, they often try and nudge you down that road. Whereas VXLANs, it is only ever an open standard implementation. So with that general concept in mind, let's go through some key concepts. So first of all, VXLANs are considered an overlay network. This means that VXLANs create an overlay infrastructure for layer two communications on top of a layer three IP network. This is very similar in effect to what a VPN does, overlaying network infrastructure on top of an actual infrastructure to basically add a new path with a new way of protecting data. But in the case of VXLANs, it's more about managing and controlling data than protecting it. And this will allow the layer two infrastructure to actually extend across physical LAN segments because the overlay is able to trick the endpoints into thinking they're both in the same LAN segment. There's a diagram coming later, I promise. But the big advantage here is basically now allows us to have the same VXLAN infrastructure at different sites or at the same site, but in different physical subnets. That's pretty cool. But obviously there is more. So the next thing is we have a new way of identifying these things. We have what's called a VNI or a VXLAN network identifier. This is a 24 bit identifier instead of the smaller one used by VLANs. Another cool thing is they're locally significant. I can use whatever particular VNI number I wanted on switch A and on switch B, I can use a completely different VNI number for the same VXLAN. So it's pretty cool. It does get a little bit confusing when you start trying to work with it, but I promise you it actually becomes pretty awesome and pretty useful once you get the hang of it. But what really matters for the VNI is it's being 24 bits gives us 16 million VXLANs. Remember, we only have 4,096 VLANs. We've got 16 million VXLANs. I don't think you're going to run out of those anytime soon. But moving along, VXLANs do encapsulation as well. 
So the encapsulation process is part of how the overlay works. And what VXLANs will do is they'll take the layer 2 Ethernet frame and they will put it into a layer 3 packet, usually using UDP for the transportation services. And that is what allows the layer 2 network to believe it is directly connected to another layer 2 network, even though there is no direct connection and there is some sort of layer 3 gateway in between them. And this allows us to basically push the traffic from layer 2 over an IP network. Now, for this to all work, we have something called a tunnel endpoint, or VTEP. VXLAN tunnel endpoint being the full term, obviously. VTEPs are devices that perform VXLAN encapsulation and de-encapsulation. These are usually the switches that are going to be closest to the endpoints that will be running the VTEP for the ingress and egress of access to the VXLAN tunneling. And it can be a physical switch or a virtual switch or a software service running on a server. It doesn't make much difference. But it is obviously going to be closer to the endpoint than it is to the core of the switched network infrastructure. And then it will have an IP address assigned to it so that it can work both layer 2 and layer 3 operations. And it is able to also use that IP address to query neighboring VTEP interfaces on a remote device to find out whether a particular endpoint is there or not, rather than us relying on something like ARP to discover the addresses and information for transmitting to another device on the same LAN infrastructure as us. So let's have some servers. And we're going to connect them to some switches, obviously. Now, in data center design, we usually refer to the layer of switches that connect the servers to the network infrastructure as the leaf layer. And then to interconnect the leaf layer together, we will probably go and create something called a spine layer. Now, odds are all of these switches would probably end up being layer 3. But I'm definitely running layer 3 at the spine layer at leaf layer. Yeah, I'm going to run a little bit of layer, layer 3 as well for the VTAP interfaces so they have IP addresses. Now, considering we're using a data center as an example here, we're probably going to use a lot of redundancy. And that lot of redundancy is going to be allowing basically every switch at the leaf layer to connect to another leaf layer switch by going through at most one spine layer switch. So we are keeping the amount of physical hops to a minimum, which is nice for the performance. But we are also going to be wanting to do a bit of IP separation here. With data centers, we've got obviously a desire to try and segment and secure as much as possible. So there's going to be a lot of layer 3 routing taking place here, even if it is being done purely through layer 3 switches. So VXLANs tend to work very nicely here, so we can have both VLAN benefits and routing benefits going for us at the same time. To do this, we are going to have a logical interface called a VEM, or a VLAN Ethernet module. And it is going to be the component that performs the encapsulation and de-encapsulation of the VXLAN traffic. The VEM is going to be associated to an IP address, which is going to be the VLAN tunnel endpoint, or the VTEP interface. Now, a VTEP will be associated with at least one, but possibly more, VNI interface numbers, or VXLAN network identifiers. It's going to be tied to that VTEP. Now, traffic would arrive on the VEM, and if it needs to be routed, the VTEP kicks in. And the VNI is going to act like a normal VLAN identifier for traditional VLANs, and just label the traffic. Now, the cool thing is, if the source and destination, let's say, is that device and that device, they need to communicate with each other. What will happen is VXLANs will set up a tunnel so that the VTEP interfaces believe that they're directly connected to each other, giving both of these devices the impression that they are on the same LAN segment. But that tunnel is created as needed, communications take place, and then it gets torn down. And this can be used for a variety of interesting communication techniques, including selective multicast, where we're using the 239 IP network. Now, as I said, VXLANs are a bit of a heavy topic for Network Plus, in my opinion. So... Take what you can from this section. You'll probably get very lightweight questions about this in the exam. But hopefully you walked away from this knowing a little bit more. But like I said to you, don't be afraid to come back to this video after you finish watching the rest of the series. Because once we do things like um, Gree Tunnels and VPNs and stuff like that and a bit of WAN stuff, 
you'll probably feel a bit more comfortable with some of these things I spoke about. Like I said though, don't murder yourself over this. If I had to pick one of these two things to remember, VLANs or VXLANs, I suggest going for VLANs. If you were sitting in a job interview with me and you could answer questions properly about VLANs and you were a bit hazy on VXLANs, but you just had Network Plus behind your name, I'd be okay with that. With Network Plus, I expect basic switching, VLANs, spanning tree protocol, routing, stuff like that we've already discussed. This is pushing it a bit for Network Plus in my opinion. But it's what CompTIA wants in it, so we will do our best. Otherwise though, I'd like to thank you for watching. And if you have any friends, family members, colleagues and peers that are interested in Network Plus, don't be afraid to share this video with them. Otherwise, I will catch you in the next video.